for me to be able to speak this morning. And I recognize that others could have been called and asked to take upon this task. And I'm very grateful that I was chosen for it. I also like to thank the elders and deacons um, who work very hard among this congregation. And I'm very grateful that they have approved of this appointment. Before I dive in, if you wouldn't mind uh, joining me in a word of prayer, and we'll jump right in. Father in heaven, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are our Jehovah Jireh, that you are our provider, and that you are our Rabboni, our teacher, our master. And Lord, as we prepare to dive into your word and into your study, let our hearts and minds be open, that we will be able to take it, receive it, and learn it for our everyday lives. And Lord, as I speak your word this morning, let me step out of the way and let you speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you about a very interesting subject as we conclude our series, Be the King's Avenue. And I want to add on to that, be the church. Sure, we are King's Avenue Baptist Church. We are in Brandon, Florida. And yes, we are trying to spread the gospel into our communities. I am well aware of that. But King's Avenue is just a name. What makes the church, it's not the name it's not the physical house that makes the church. What makes the church is all of us here. We make the church. Because I am reminded of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse number 20, when two or more are gathered in my name, there I will be present. Amen? And you're probably thinking, well, well Curtis, we've been talking about spreading the gospel in this series. What's so different about this one? Well, number one, we're wrapping things up. That's number one. But number two, this is something for your consideration. This is something that we ought to do in our everyday routines. So if you will join me in Matthew 28, turn to, Ma turn to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. I'm going to begin in verse 18, but I'm going to reference verse 19. And just to give you a quick summarization, summarization excuse me, of the events that already took place. This was after the crucifixion we read about in Matthew 27. This was after the resurrection and after Jesus has spent 40 days on the earth. And here he's getting ready to ascend. We read about in Acts chapter 1, around about verse number 5. And before he's ascended, we, we read about him giving instructions. I don't want to call it his last hurrah because that makes him sound like an earthly king. Can you work with me on that? So here he's given his apostles instructions. He starts off by saying in verse 18, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I'll establish more about that in just a moment. In verse 19 is where I really want to dive into. This is what's known as the Great Commission where Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, stepping out into our communities, stepping out into our culture, and to be able to proclaim the gospel. Let me shoot straight with you about something, as my mentor always says. Let me shoot straight with you. We as Christians will oftentimes hear this idea or notion about stepping out and telling somebody about Jesus. And we'll oftentimes talk about it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I need, to, I need to tell Jesus to my friends. I need to tell Jesus to my coworkers. I need to tell Jesus to my neighbors. You get my point. We always talk, but we don't necessarily walk it out. We talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk. And the question then becomes why? Why is it? Why is it that we always talk? Why is it? I want to offer this question for your consideration this morning. What's holding you back? That's the name of this lesson on this morning. It's what's holding you back? What is stopping you? What is restraining you from telling other people about Christ? And when I talk about restraints, I'm speaking spiritual restraints. I'm not speaking literally. And sometimes, in some cases, it's not often what's holding you back, but it's oftentimes who. I'll establish more about that momentarily. I want to ask you three simple questions for your consideration. And you notice some blanks on the back of your bulletin. Going to be taking some notes on this morning. And no, this is not a typical school day. It's just something, something for you to take away from. So in the first blank, 
Is fear stopping you? Is fear stopping you? Are you afraid to tell somebody about Christ? What's there to be afraid of? Oh, well, Brother Curtis, since you asked that, uh, if I tell somebody about Jesus, then, then they won't speak to me. They won't interact with me. They want nothing to do with me. Why would you make that assumption when you haven't even told that person about Christ yet? I believe that's worth repeating, don't y'all? Why would you make that conclusion? Why would you make that assumption that they won't speak to you again when you haven't even tried to tell that person about Christ? Oftentimes, for a lot of us, it's a fear of the unknown, a fear of anticipation, not knowing what to expect. Folks, we're not mind readers. We can't predict the outcome. We just got to do it. Or as doctors like to say in the medical field, let nature take its course. It's a little quiet in here. That's fine. Nobody got that. It's okay. (laughs) But if you read throughout scripture, it has a wide range of information that regards the subject of fear. Fear starts back in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve had given in to sin. And and when the Lord appeared to them, they ran and they hid from the Lord. Number one, they were ashamed because God had told them specifically not to do something. And they did the thing that God had told them not to do. Referring from Genesis chapter 2 verse number 15. But also they're afraid. Just like them is the fear of the unknown. Not knowing what what God was going to do to them. But of course, if you disobey God, you know, it's pretty written right there, right? And of course, we know the end result, them getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And then we proceed in Exodus chapter 3. This is the account of Moses in the burning bush, where God comes to Moses and gives him a task. Actually, actually, three tasks, if you think about it. He says in verse number 10, Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. So God has given them a task to go go back to Egypt to confront Pharaoh and to let his people, the sons of Israel, go. But watch Moses' response in the very next verse. But Moses said to God, this is verse 11, who am I? Think about that phrase for just a moment. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Brothers and sisters, he let fear take over. And sometimes we're like a Moses, when we let fear take over and not only fear taking over, but then what does Moses start to do? Make excuses for himself. He makes excuses. Oh, I can't do that. Lord, send somebody else. I'm not qualified. I'm not worthy of this task. Well, if God thought that you weren't ready, he wouldn't have called you. If God thought that you weren't ready for this task, he wouldn't have called you because he says in the very next verse in verse 12, certainly I will be with you. Amen. God is with us through all of it. Let me give you a practical example. When Brother John became the senior pastor of this congregation, he could have made, he could have pulled a Moses and made excuses for himself. Lord, I'm not ready. I'm good where I'm at. Lord, send somebody else. But God knew that he was ready. John may not know it at the time, but God knew that he was ready because God knows the plans that are in all of our lives. And look where he is now obviously in the front row, but look where he is now. (laughs) Wow, this was better than the first service. (laughs) Some didn't get that. That's good. But jumping to the New Testament, what what does the writers there have to say about this subject? In in Romans chapter 8, Paul makes a very distinctive notion. What then shall we say to these things if God is for us? then who is against us? Amen? In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, or some of your other translations will say spirit of fear. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and discipline. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6, be anxious for nothing. If you read in the message version, it says, don't fret for anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. God's got this, y'all. Amen, he's got this. In Romans chapter 12, verse two, 
I've heard this numerous times, and do not be conformed to this world, or other translations will say, to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect will. This idea kind of goes back to a lesson I gave to Elevate, I believe it was last year or so, and I spoke to them about standing firm in their faith, referring from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 13. But I showed them the account of when Jesus was tempted in Matthew 4. Jesus was able to stand firm in his faith. If he could stand firm in his faith, then so can all of us here. Oh, but Brother Curtis, I got, I got a problem with this temptation. This temptation has consumed me. I won't be able to get out of it. Well, number one, you will get out of it. Because I am reminded of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 13, that no temptation has overtaken you. Oh, some temptations, no temptations. 25% of temptations, no temptations. You could give me a whole list of temptations that you may have struggled with or that, you're, that we're continuing to struggle with. I could guarantee you that none of those has overtaken you. And God is faithful, amen, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but the temptation will provide a way of escape also so that you may be able to endure it. So Paul's saying you have a choice. You can either, as Brother John puts it, submit to it, or you can resist it. I go with resisting if I were you. So don't be afraid to tell the world about Christ because believe me, somebody needs to hear about Jesus. Amen? Somebody needs to hear about Jesus. God is with you until you give your final breath. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 20. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 6 and verse 8. He will be with us always. Psalms chapter 23, verse number 4. I could go on and on, but time is of the essence. So don't be afraid of what this world has to offer. God has called you, so go and do it. For example, in my life, God has called me to this type of ministry. That's why I'm in seminary, and I haven't looked back on it. I haven't looked back. Don't let others tell you differently, which then transitions to my next point. Point number two is judgment stopping you. Is judgment stopping you? Are the judgments, are the little gossips, are the little smack talks that we heard about ourselves, are any of those things getting in the way? I understand what it's like to, to be criticized. Hopefully I'll be able to explain more in the next series. But I know what it's like, and it hurts. But you know what? By the grace of God, here I am at now. Don't worry about judgment. James goes on to write in James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, it says, Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. Verse 12, there is only one lawgiver and judge, amen, the one who is able to save and to destroy. Watch part B of this text. But who are you who judge your neighbor? Who are we to judge the person we're sitting next to? Who are we to judge anybody? You know what it all boils down to? In the words of the late Aretha Franklin, R-E-S-P-C-T. <laughs> it all boils down to respect. We need to respect one another. We may, not like, we may not like what they say. We may not like what they do. But you know what? They are just as human as you and I. They are just as human. So don't let the judgment of others get in the way. God will take care of those who judge, amen? In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus was starting to round up his 12 apostles and was giving them instructions. He tells them in verse 19, if they arrest you, do not worry about what they say. Now I'm praying in the name of Jesus, nobody walks out of here and gets arrested, okay? Don't do that. All right, it's a little quiet, it's okay. In verse 28, he tells them, he also tells them to not worry of those who could kill the body and not the soul. Because as we know, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, absence from the body is present with the Lord. Amen. But going back to what I said about respecting one another, I believe we need to respect those who are, on, those who are in Washington. And you know how some people fast on different things? Well, right now I'm fasting on news, both locally and nationally. Because nine times out of ten, 
there's always judgmental. There's always criticism. They're always disrespecting one another. And I remember the Lord telling me one day, you got better things to do than to watch people, you know, criticize each other with their words. You got better things to do. How do I know this? Paul goes on to write in Romans chapter 13, verse number one, every person is to be a subjection to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from who? God, amen. And those which exist are established by God. Our nation was built on Christian standards. You know why they took out the Pledge of Allegiance in public schools? Because they had the phrase, one nation under God. That one little phrase, they had to take the whole thing out. And it breaks my heart. The reason why we have those people in those offices now is because, is because God placed them there. God placed them there for a reason. Now, Peter goes on to write in Acts chapter 5, verse number 29, that we'd rather obey God rather than man. Is he trying to say that we need to grab our torches and pitchforks and have another march on Washington? No, he's not trying to say that at all. What he's saying is that we need to obey God's instruction while we're here on the earth. Amen? If we acknowledge Jesus before others, then he'll acknowledge us before God the Father. But if we deny him, he'll deny us. That's not me talking. That's Jesus talking. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Don't let others judge you because you're a Christian. Hello. Don't let others judge you because you're a Christian. I recommend you seeing the movie, God's Not Dead. Either one, two, or three, or all three of them. Very powerful account about this subject right here. Finally, is persecution stopping you? I hate to burst your bubbles. Persecution is going to happen. Persecution is going to happen. For, for example, there was a small church a few years ago in Texas where over 20 people in that congregation had lost their lives. You know why? Because they were a Christian. Those kind of stories break my heart, man. It really does. That's just one example. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1 says, But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Storms of life is going to be raging in for all of us. But we shouldn't worry about it. Because I am reminded of what Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse number 33, that even though there will be troubles, that there will be trials, that there will be storms of life raging in, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. We shouldn't let these things intimidate us. Satan wants you to be intimidated by these things. I was listening to my mentor speak at a church conference in South Florida. And he made this statement that really calls me to reflect as I was preparing this. He says, brothers and sisters, I speak to our shame that we would allow culture to impact the church rather than the church to impact culture. He says, we got that twisted. Do you believe that? I believe that. It's such a shame that we would allow our community, that we would allow our society to make an impact on the body of believers. But when Jesus called us in Matthew chapter 28, we ought to make an impact on the culture. We need to get that turned around. Starting today, we need to get that turned around. Another example of persecution of Christians happened over in Iraq. Iraqi Christians were losing their lives on a daily basis because they were a Christian. Even in scripture, we read about in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, who was considered the first martyr, was stoned for his beliefs. But if you read towards the end of Acts 7, he never stopped looking up towards God. He never once looked away. He never once looking over to Paul, who was then Saul. He never did any of that. He still remained focused. Even Paul was persecuted for his beliefs after he was converted to Christianity in Acts chapter 9. You read throughout the New Testament, he was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He was thrown in prison. And even at one account, he was bitten by a venomous snake. 
But had Paul listened to the world, had Paul listened to those persecutors, they wouldn't be two thirds of the New Testament that we have today. We can't let persecution get in the way. Satan does not want us to fill the duties that God has called us to do. He wants, he wants to make us feel weak, make us feel less important. But Paul wrote in Ephesians 2.10, we were made in his workmanship. We were made in his masterpiece, amen? In Matthew chapter five, this was Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount, brilliant account. In verses 10 through 12, Jesus says, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of, my, because of me. Verse 12, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I brought up these, sets, these next sets of verses on the last time I spoke, which was last July. Matthew 5, verses 43 and 44, where Jesus goes on to say, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Referring from Leviticus chapter 19, verse number 18. But I say to you, love your enemies. Oh, what? We need to love our enemies? Nope, sorry, Christ, I can't do that. I'm walking out the door. I cannot do that. I cannot love my enemies at all. You didn't read part B of the text. Part B says, and pray for those who persecute against you. I know it's easier said than done, loving our enemies. But it's right there in the text. We need to pray for them. I close with these closing thoughts. I'm sure that there are other things that could get in the way. I'm sure that there are other factors that could stop us. But for me, as I was preparing, these are the big three factors for me. Fear, judgment, and persecution. Don't worry. Don't be worried about anything that happens. Just give it a thing, everything up to God. Give it, up, give it all up. Because I'm reminded of what the psalm writer wrote in Psalms 55 verse 22. Cast all of your burdens upon him and he will sustain you. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all anxieties. Yes, the text says anxieties to him because he cares for you. And let me be real honest with you. If God didn't care for you, you wouldn't be where you're at right now. But he loved you that much. And look where you guys are at right now. We have a God who, who loves us and wants to have that relationship with you. James 4 verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you and the devil will flee. I recently watched a movie, well not recently, it was a few years ago, with the congregation called The Insanity of God. And I'm just getting into reading it. Very powerful accounts. But there was one story in particular that I'll never forget. His name was Dmitri. He was living in Russia. And he started a Bible study with just his family. And then it grew, and then it grew, and then it grew. People were wanting to hear about Christ. Well, one night, it was a Tuesday night, the book says, the police came into the door and they were getting ready to arrest him. And his wife, and I'm taking quotes from the book here, his wife, sounding like an Old Testament prophet, was saying, you have laid your hands on the man of God and you will not survive. That was on a Tuesday. That Thursday, that arresting officer dropped dead of a heart attack. So the Russian government, they had no idea what they're getting themselves into. So they decided to arrest him, haul him off to prison. While he was in prison, he would find pieces of paper and write down verses that he had memorized. He got beaten for it. He would sing a hymn in their native language every day. Got beaten up for it. They even convinced him that his wife had been murdered and that his children were taken by the state. So finally, one day he says, all right, I give up. I'll sign whatever it is you want me to sign. So now Dimitri has a choice to make. I, mean, I know it's not nothing like this, but for the sake of the story, he, will have, he has a choice to make. He would have to deny his faith. 
and be free from prison, or he could stand up for his faith. So he prayed all night and prayed and prayed and prayed. The next morning, they came over to him and they said, all right, here, here it is. What do you say? You want to know what Dimitri's response was? I'm not signing in. I'm not signing in. Because I know by the grace of God, my wife and my children are okay. And I'll continue to preach and teach the doctrines of Jesus Christ for as long as I shall live. He stood firm in his faith. But whenever they went to beat him up again, this was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. 1,500, not 150, 1,500 inmates stepped out of their cells, lifted up their hands to the heavens and sang the very same hymn that Dimitri was singing for the past 17 years. Don't tell me God does not work. Don't you dare tell me that because I'll prove to you otherwise. Just like Dimitri, standing firm in his faith, we need to do the same. And you know what Dimitri's son is doing now? He's now a pastor at that prison. And whenever that, the singing was going on, they asked, they asked Dimitri, who are you? He says, I am a son of the living God, and Jesus is his name. And he was let go. He was freed from prison. Just like Dimitri standing firm in his faith, we need to do the same. Now, for those who may not know, we do an event here every December called Walk Through Bethlehem. Great outreach to this community. I believe last year we hit over 5,000. But let me be real honest with you about Walk Through Bethlehem for a moment. That is not the only time to tell our community about Christ. We wait and we wait until December. Where were we back in January? We had the whole year to, out, to, to make an outreach. We had a whole year, but we wait until December. Watch, I'm probably not going to be a guide after saying that. It's okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to make a point here. There is so much more we can do. Not just walk the Bethlehem, although it's great, but that's just one of the things we can do. There are other things that we can do. My two challenges to you is this. Number one, try and spread the gospel. Plant and sow the seed in those people. And if they accept it for the first time, that is awesome. That is great. But if they don't, don't be discouraged. You planted and sown the seed. You planted and sown the seed. And it's their choice if they want to grow and mature in the word, as it says in Luke chapter two, verse number 52. But my other challenge is for us to take this, receive it, and learn it. Just real quickly, to take it, that's when, that's when the word of God is being spoken. And us hearing the word, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, for faith comes by hearing the word. So that's taking it in. Then to receive it, after the word of God is being spoken, we received it into our hearts. Mark chapter 11, verse 24, or Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. And then the learn it, that's the application process. That's, what, that's us taking what we heard, receiving it to our hearts, and now we gotta, we gotta apply it. Whereas Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And then my whole phrase can be summarized in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. So I want you to repeat this after me. Say, take it, receive it, learn it. One more time, take it, receive it, learn it. I'm telling you, you apply those three things to your individual studies or group study, your life will change. Believe me, my, my life was changed. So the next time you ask the question, what's holding me back or who's holding me back, say, there is nothing. That's holding me back. And don't sing the song that you hear on the radio about it. That's not what I'm referring to. So I just spoke to you about spreading the gospel, about what's holding you back, right? As we come to our time of invitation, let me ask you this question. What is holding you back from accepting Jesus into your life? Is it these factors? 
Is it somebody you know? I don't know. That's between you and the Lord. But whatever is holding you back from accepting Jesus in your life, let go of it. Remove the distractions. Because I learned from when my mentor last preached, he said, there are too many people when it comes to the invitation going towards the exits and not so much this way. There's too many people going that way, not so much this way. If you have any concerns, struggles that you may be going through, come pray with us. I'll be down here. Brother John will be down here. We'll be more than happy to pray with you. The altar is open. The altar is open. Is Jesus knocking on the door of your life this morning? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are a wonderful God. And Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to declare your word. Lord, help us not to let anything hold us back from fulfilling your duties that you have called us to do. Whether it's spreading the gospel or accepting you into our life, Lord, let our bondages, let our chains, let our restraints be broken. And I declare in the name of Jesus that those bondages are broken. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you'll bless them, that you'll provide for them, because you are our Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider. Be with us. Help us to fulfill your duties because, Lord, you want that relationship with all of us. Help us to draw closer and closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.